A host of recent actions by the Supreme Court has sent certain powers back to the states. Abortion, gun control, and voting rights among them, with more decisions expected in the court's next term. The concept of federalism, the idea that the federal government's authority is limited, is a cornerstone of modern conservatism. But historically, states' rights have also been used as cover to allow southern states in particular to discriminate against African Americans and other marginalized groups. Joining us now to discuss states' rights and the Supreme Court are Joseph Morris, partner at the law firm Morris and De La Rosa, and the chairman of the board at the free market think tank, the Heartland Institute. And for transparency, we should note that Mr. Morris is also the chair of WTTW's Community Advisory Board. Harold Krent, professor of law at Chicago Kent College of Law at Illinois Tech. Krent was previously the longtime dean of the law school before stepping down from that role in 2019. And Alvin Tillery, associate professor of political science at Northwestern University. Gentlemen, thanks to all three of you for joining us. So we should say, we should clarify, the Tenth Amendment determines the relation and powers of the federal government and the states. Here's what it says, quote, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. Alvin Tillery, coming to you first, please. When you hear the term states' rights, you know, as a scholar of politics and American political development, uh, what does that term bring to mind for you? Well, it certainly brings to mind the the Tenth Amendment, but it also brings to mind the broader context uh, in which the term has entered our political lexicon, There have been four movements in American history when the term states' rights has gained momentum and coalitions of states have acted to uh, suppress black freedom. Uh, From the founding of the Constitution, which led to four pro-slavery clauses in the Constitution, to the Civil War, uh, to the counter-reconstruction movement between 1874 and 1876, and of course the modern states' rights movement, led by people like Strom Thurmond and and, uh, George Wallace in opposition to the decision in Brown versus Board of Education to desegregate public schools. Um, And you've kind of just done it, like taking us through a little bit of the history of how the notion of states' rights has been used to discriminate against African Americans um, and others. Uh, You know, Joe Morris, if the notion of states' rights has permitted states uh, to discriminate against African Americans and others, does that in any way invalidate it as a legal theory? Well, hardly. And I think Mr. Tillery overlooked an important era in, in states' rights thinking prior to the Civil War, where it was states' rights uh, that were quite contrary. States' rights were asserted contrary to slavery. The, the free states uh, did not want to enforce the Federal Fugitive Slave Acts, for example, that recognized the property rights claims of people in the South to own slaves. When uh, uh, African Americans escaped or otherwise arrived in the free states, the free states wanted to apply their own laws of citizenship and negate the property claims of slaveholders and so forth. But uh, their assertion of states' rights were frustrated uh, by the federal government, which insisted on enforcing the Federal Fugitive Slave Acts over and against states' rights in order to enforce the property rights claims under state law of of, uh, slaveholders in the South. So there's... The tradition of states' rights cuts in, 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 in both directions, and uh, it, it's an important safeguard, I think, even today for African Americans, for all of us, it is at the level of the states where all those wonderful rights that are not enumerated in the Ninth Amendment uh, are determined. It, it, even, even today in litigation in federal courts over property rights and liberty rights and so forth, the federal courts have to look to state law to determine what those rights are. And I think it's really important to return the focus to the liberty and property notions of state law and get get our individual rights protected by the states. That's the first level of defense. It's a conceit of the 20th century that's just wrong, uh, that the federal government is the overarching protector of everybody's civil rights. We must look to the states in the first instance to define and protect civil rights. And if we do that, I think we are we are safer and our rights are more secure. Harold Grant, what do you make of how the court has used states' rights as the justification for overturning what is what was 50 years of precedent uh, with the Dobbs decision, which overturned the Roe decision? I want to take a brief step back and say that states' rights is really another name for federalism, which is our basic structure of government, which allocates some power to the states and some power to the federal government. It's neither liberal nor conservative. It's the idea of having a check and a balance and making sure that all power is not uh, devolved in one entity. So it can be used for good and for bad reasons. You know, certainly, as Professor Tillery suggested, uh, states' rights has been used 
against uh, the racial justice for years because there's been no federal floor. And so the big decision has been when does the federal government come in and say there is a floor of protection of rights and when doesn't. Um, and that's contestable. This court has said there is a federal floor with respect to the Second Amendment, but not with respect to abortion. There is a federal floor with respect to vigorous enforcement of religion, um, but not with respect to uh, economic or racial justice. So these are the lines that have become now are being determined by the court because the, what the court can do is it can say, is, does the Constitution by itself decide that there is sweeping power with the national government to protect a certain right? Um, and of course, there is the power in Congress to do so in terms of protecting abortion rights, but they've held recently that that right does not exist in the Dobbs case, does not exist in the Constitution itself. So this court is still looking at when the state's rights exist, when the federal rights exist, but they've come down in saying that there is no constitutional protection for abortion, um, and so therefore it has to be protected on a state-by-state -state basis, just as it did before Roe versus Wade. Uh, Alvin Tillery, the Supreme Court's indicated that they um, will uh, hear a case from North Carolina involving the so-called independent state legislature theory. Uh, court watchers are concerned, though, uh, that the court may decide this case in a way that would undermine elections um, if uh, if some states have uh, a lot of have free reign, basically. Um, Alvin Tillery, what do you make of this theory and what do you anticipate the Supreme Court will do? Well, first I'll say uh, in response to Mr. Morris that I, I did not overlook the uh, abolitionist movement in failing to enforce the uh, Fugitive Slave Act. I, I did not cite it because it's not, it was nowhere near as robust as those other four movements that I did cite. And I would challenge him to name a movement that was that robust, in, particularly in, in the modern era. Secondly, I will say uh, that I, I suspect uh, that the Roberts Court will uh, take up the independent state legislature theory and will rule in favor of uh, the state legislatures, giving them power over federal elections. Um, that, that's what I'm expecting to happen. And what do you make of that theory? Well, I mean, it's certainly in the text. I, I'm not a, you know, a, a pure textualist, but I prefer textualism to originalism. And so I would say that there's a strong argument, uh, you know, for a textualist that that is the w one way that the law may be construed. Uh, we've not historically construed it that way. Uh, and so, but I'll leave it to, uh, you know, Professor Krent, who probably has greater expertise in this than, than, than I do, uh, to, to say more about and, it. And before we go back to Professor Krent, I do want to get Joe Morris in here because you've been given a challenge by uh, Professor <laughs> Tillery. Uh, but I also do want to hear, what do you expect the Supreme Court to do with that case? Well, I hope and I expect that the Supreme Court will say that the text of the Constitution means what it says and the responsibility for setting the rules for the conduct of elections are assigned to the state legislatures, state by state. Mr. Tillery is correct that there are texts that support that in the same way uh, Professor Krent is correct in saying that texts support uh, the federal role in enforcing religion rights. There's the First Amendment. The text supports the federal role in enforcing uh, uh, gun rights. That's the Second Amendment. The text uh, supports uh, equality of the law and pro prohibition of slavery. Those are the 13th and 14th Amendments. Uh, but there are other areas where the text does not support federal authority, and it's in those areas then that the Tenth Amendment assigns the responsibility of the states. That's what the text says, and if we're serious about being constitutionalists, that's what we should do. And now, with, with respect to the the, uh, uh, the question of states' rights in the in the nineteenth century, I think that the, it really it did come to a crux in a very robust way in the Dred Scott decision, where where in in Dred Scott the the, the, the United States Supreme Court held that federal law was going to supersede uh, state law in, on the question of slavery. It was a terrible mistake. Uh, the, the court held rather akin to Roe versus Wade that African-Americans were subhuman. Uh, they were not persons and under federal law, not, and, and, and notwithstanding what state law and free states might have said. Uh, that decision by the United States Supreme Court had to be overruled. Unfortunately, in the 19th century, it was overruled by war. It wasn't until after the war that we enacted this, the 13th and 14th Amendments to, over, to, to modify the text of the Constitution. Uh, thank God in the, in the 20th and 21st centuries, we've overruled the decision of the uh, United States Supreme Court in Roe versus Wade that pre-born people are subhuman uh, without war. Uh, we, we've done it by overruling a wrong-headed Supreme Court decision that took the matter out of the democratic process, took it away from the states, private property rights, and excuse me, 
liberty rights are supposed to be defined and returned it to them. I think we would have had a much more peaceful last half century if uh, Harry Blackman's decision in Roe versus Wade had not been the prevailing law for the last five decades. Well, and the Dobbs decision, it's not the first time the court has undone something that it, it, it's done in the past. But Harold Crenn, I want to give you the last word. How far do you think this court will go in asserting the power of the states uh, in relation to the federal government? So just briefly, I mean, I think that you know, the Constitution provisions are not clear. The Second Amendment, no one knew what it mean. We've changed it radically in the last uh, generation. No one even knows what the First Amendment means. That's changed. So the idea that this is written in stone, I think, is is a fiction. And that's the same thing true with the idea of this voting rights case coming out of North Carolina, because what the court is asked to say is that the state legislature must decide a kind of voting eligibility, despite what the state constitution says and the state judiciary says. Well, that's not clear. Where did that come from? That's privileging one part of the state as opposed to the other. That's no kind of coherent theory of federalism that I'm aware of. So these are subjective value judgments that we wish didn't happen, but that do happen at the halls of the, of the highest court. And the highest court is taking us in a very uh, rightward direction. And the question is where they're going to stop and put on your seatbelts. <laughs> Time will tell. That's a, a robust discussion, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining me. Alvin Tillery, Harold Crent, and Joseph Morris.